Thank you, Bryony. Oh, it's a heavy passage, isn't it? We've been spending a few weeks of our sermons looking at the events which took place uh, perhaps within the final 18 hours or so of Jesus' earthly ministry before he died on the cross. We've gazed in on four encounters so far, and there'll be three more to go before that first Easter morning in a fortnight's time. As I was preparing this sermon after reading that reading, I felt overcome with sadness. And as I reflected upon this series uh, and what's still to come, I thought, gosh, this is all a bit bleak, isn't it? We're spending seven sermons in all moving around the events of the most depraved event in history, the murder of God. It feels heavy. It feels burdensome. And sometimes I've wanted to pause the series to inject a little light relief into the mix, you know, bring out Theo and bring some joy. But that would be a false joy. We're in a season of Lent, traditionally a season of fasting in order for us to unite ourselves closer with Jesus. It's a season of grief, of lament, of repentance, of self-examination, of self-denial, of study, of penitence and preparation. Who knows what the liturgical title is for the first day of Lent? Who knows? Thank you, Di. Ash Wednesday. Who knows what traditionally happens in an Ash Wednesday service? The clue is in the name. Yeah, you have, uh, people would often receive a cross on their forehead made of ash. What a strange thing to do, isn't it? I remember in London, when I worked in the city, um, and we used to visit churches around the city during lunch breaks, and I went to an Ash Wednesday service. And I had ashes put on my head, and the rest of my day I was in the office with ashes on my head, and I felt like a right numpty. In the Bible, ashes are often closely tied to great mourning or repentance, and were a visible sign of an inner grief or turmoil. So although I may want to to pull back from this darkest moment in mankind's history, it is right for us to journey together on the hard and painful road to the cross because as we journey together, we journey with our Lord and Saviour who is shouldering that heavy cross for us. And where we see something of our own reflection in this abysmal gallery of human failure, we also experience the healing balm of God's love to cleanse us of all our guilt and shame and to renew in us the glory of God's image. Please bow your heads to pray. Father, as we look in on this awful encounter with great sadness, stir our hearts with the joy of the love you have shown us. Lead us to repentance and by your spirit, renew in us a desire and joy to live for your glory. Amen. Who do you fear? It's a bit of an odd question, isn't it? Who do you fear? I guess, to put it another way, whose opinion of you do you value most? Who is it who always you always want to please? Or you want to be seen to do the right thing by? Maybe it's someone who has the power to make your life tough and so you fear what they could do so you obey them and do what they say. Maybe it's someone who you greatly admire, you're always seeking to get their approval of. For me, I can can think of two characters in my life, my dad being one. I remember um, always wanting to please my dad and do the right thing by him. We were an Indian household and there's certain ways that we we do things that meant that deference and, and pleasing dad was a big deal. And I remember one day, I made a decision that Dad didn't like. I remember feeling really crushed by the fact that what I did wasn't something that he approved of, that he didn't think was good. It wasn't a bad thing, it wasn't sinful, but it didn't meet his standards. Fearing someone isn't necessarily a negative thing. I have great love for my wife, as you'd probably be pleased to hear. So I fear upsetting her by doing the wrong things. That's not because I'm afraid of her. I'm not, my love, I love you. But it's because I don't want to hurt her. Or I don't want her to experience shame because of something I've done. I fear her in that way. In our daily lives, there are people God has placed around us that can shape how we act out of fear, like a parent or a teacher or a boss or a bully or a loved one or or anyone. And in today's encounter around the cross, we meet the two most powerful men in Jerusalem, and we will see who they fear the most. 
What God is saying to us today through this small encounter in his word is this. Fear God and bring glory to his son, Jesus. Fear God and bring glory to his son, Jesus. So today we meet Pontius Pilate and we see him in all four gospels and all of them have a very similar account of him and his actions, each uh, with their own flavor, of course. John perhaps has the longest encounter and unique to John includes some of those behind closed doors conversations between Jesus and Pilate that we don't get so much of in the other gospels. Pilate was a Roman governor of the region of Judea and served under the emperor Tiberius from about the years 26 to 36 AD. You probably know that Judea was a Roman province and to ensure order and to prevent an uprising, governors or prefects were installed in each province in the Roman Empire. Judea had a checkered history with occupation, including the famous Maccabean revolt against the Greeks nearly 200 years earlier. And next week, we'll meet a guy called Barabbas, who was imprisoned for committing murder in a riot, in an uprising against Romans. And the Jewish leaders were already acutely aware that a riot could be around the corner. And what it could cost them when they said in John chapter 11, verse 48... If we let Jesus go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. There's a great fear amongst the Jewish leaders of what Rome will do if there was an uprising led by Jesus. So Pilate was both feared and despised. A feared man who had the greatest power in Judea, who spoke and executed judgment on behalf of the nation of Rome. And despised because as a conquering parasite who ensured the Romans' sandal remained firmly on the Jewish neck. Pilate also had, when he arrived, raided the Jewish treasuries and used money from the temple tax to build an aqueduct that made him very unpopular with the nation around him. Our encounter begins early in the morning, shortly after the rooster crowed and Jesus gazed piercingly into Peter's soul, as we heard about a few weeks ago. Jesus so far has been arrested, interrogated by Annas and Caiaphas, and now has been brought into the court of Pilate. In verse 29, Pilate asks what charges the Jewish leaders were presenting against Jesus. But they can't reply. Instead, uh, they give a politician's answer in verse 30. If Jesus was not a criminal, would we have handed him over to you? Pilate hasn't got time for these sort of shenanigans. It's a happy time for St. Patrick's Day, so shenanigans is a, a good word to say. Uh, and so he tries to send them away, verse 31. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own laws, Pilate replied. The Jewish leaders respond, but we have no right to execute anyone. It's not quite true, really. The Sanhedrin, that's the, the ruling religious party, did have laws that permitted the death penalty. You can read about them in your Bible. However, since Roman, since Rome sorry, was in charge, they required the governor's approval for an execution. Now, sure, the Jewish leaders could have stoned Jesus to death, and we see that happen to Stephen in Acts chapter 7, just a few weeks from now. They probably would have got told off, but they could have done it, and they could have got away with it. So why were they bringing Jesus to Pilate? Why were they asking Pilate to execute their criminal? The answer is that Caiaphas wanted Jesus to be completely humiliated. Jesus was becoming very popular, as we would see on on Palm Sunday, and the crowds were building around him. If Jesus had been stoned to death, he would have been hailed as a martyr. So Caiaphas needed something else. He needed Jesus to be crucified, which only the Romans can do. In the book of Deuteronomy, we're told that anyone who is hung on a pole or a tree is cursed by God. So if Caiaphas could have Jesus hung on a wooden cross, the modern equivalent of a tree, then surely that crowd of fanatic followers would realize that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because God would not curse his chosen one. But little did Caiaphas realize that Jesus had prophesied just this about himself in John chapter 3 when he said, just as, Moses lift, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, 
to be pleased and I'm not going to work through this long encounter in detail. I think the tragedy of this story speaks for itself, doesn't it? Instead, I want to look at how Pilate handles this encounter with Jesus, God's Christ, the Son of God. During the trial, Pilate makes four attempts to throw the responsibility to execute Jesus off his shoulders. Did you see that? So firstly, he tries to put the responsibility back on the Jewish leaders. And we saw this just now in verse 31, where he told the leaders to judge Jesus themselves. Secondly, he tried to find another way to have Jesus released by, in verse 39, presenting Barabbas as an alternative to Jesus. We'll hear about that next week. In Matthew's account, we're told that the Jewish leaders whipped up the crowd to call for Barabbas' release instead. Thirdly, in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 19, he ordered Jesus to be flogged instead as a compromise, hoping that that level of brutality and humiliation would be enough to appease the Jewish leaders. But, again, it's the leaders who call for Jesus' death, shouting, crucify, crucify. Pilate's last attempt was to reason with Jesus' accusers in chapter 19, verse 15. Until, verse 16, finally Pilate handed Jesus over to them, the leaders, to be crucified. You know, Pilate didn't actually want to kill Jesus. Did you catch that? In chapter 19, verse 12, John writes... From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. As we work through the narrative, we see Pilate becoming more and more concerned for Jesus, even becoming afraid of who Jesus might be. Chapter 19, verse 8. I think it's in Luke's encounter, you remember, that Pilate's wife comes to him and says, have nothing to do with this man. He is innocent after I've dreamed about him. God speaking to Pilate through his wife in a dream. Pilate had great power. He was the most powerful official in all of Judea with the power to give life and bring death, as he says to Jesus in verse 10. And yet, with all his power, Pilate was impotent. He couldn't do what he wanted. Pilate's power was a a derived power. It comes to him because he's an official of the Emperor Tiberius, the most powerful man in the known world at the time. What Pilate does, he does in Tiberius' name for Tiberius' glory and honor. And yet, Pilate's power is being restrained, is being cheapened with the call of a jeering crowd. Why? My children uh, might sometimes be acting loud or in a boisterous way. You might see them charging around church. And I can suddenly feel the heavy gaze of everyone around me as they stare, not in church, obviously, as they stare at my children, and in my mind, I see them judging me for my poor parenting. No one here does that. So in that moment, I might be overcritical or more forceful in telling my kids off. Ah, see at my dominance. What's happening there? They might be doing nothing wrong. They might just be being kids. The issue wasn't my children. The issue was that I, in that moment, was more concerned about what the people around me were thinking and the judgments they were making. I was more concerned about other people's views of me than I was in that moment for showing love and care to my own children. This is known as the fear of man. Can you relate? There are moments in life where we need to make decisions and we need to weigh up all the options. We know what we should do, often it's quite obvious, but we're afraid of the consequences or of what people will think about us or say about us. And so we do something else instead. This is the fear of man. In this moment, Pilate, with all his power, all his authority, was more afraid of the Jewish leaders than he was about doing the right thing, condemning an innocent man. Pilate had the fear of man. So Pilate used his God-given power to bring glory to the Jewish leaders. 
as humans made in God's image, we might regularly find ourselves in situations where we need to speak up for truth and justice to help those God places around us. As Christians, we might find ourselves in situations where we have the opportunity to speak up for God and for his good ways. When someone asks us if we follow Jesus or when someone asks us what we did on Sunday and we're too embarrassed to admit coming to church or when God says, what God says clashes with the culture around us or when following God says, what God says could cost us a job or even a relationship. In these many situations and many more, God places us in. We are faced with a question. Do we fear God? Or do we fear man? As the writer of Proverbs declares in chapter, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. For the unbeliever, someone who doesn't love Jesus, that fear of God is a fear of the consequences of their sins. But for the Christian, for those of us who believe, the fear of the Lord is about reverence and awe in knowledge of who God is, as the writer to Hebrews puts it in chapter 12. Let us worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Pilate feared man, and so he was corruptible and weak and made terrible choices that led to the execution of the God of the universe in his son, Jesus Christ. However, there is another man in this narrative who did fear God. In Matthew chapter 26, we read that Jesus could have commanded legions of angels to come to his aid during his arrest, but he chose not to. Jesus who reveals to Pilate that he is the king in a spiritual realm and of the Jewish people. Jesus who reveals to Pilate that the power Pilate has comes directly from God. Jesus had the power and authority to stop this whole sordid ordeal and to bring judgment and justice on all those who oppose God and his chosen one. But Jesus feared God, not man, and in doing so brought glory to God. Sisters and brothers, if we fear the people in the world around us, we will make bad choices and we will easily be corrupted and behave sinfully, like Pilate, like Peter did a few weeks ago in denying Jesus. But if we fear God in a loving, awesome way, we will bring glory to Jesus, following in the way of our Lord that may look shameful in the eyes of the world, but will bring honor to God as we act as his faithful children, just like his perfect son Jesus. In a moment, we're about to have communion, a meal together, a symbol of which shows us that when we get this wrong, which we all will, we are forgiven, not because we have obeyed God perfectly for every moment of our lives, but because Jesus did in our place. So however your heart is today, however heavy it is with what you've heard or overjoyed it is with what Jesus has done, I pray that this morning we would all come to fear God in the right way, to put our trust in him, and to live for his glory and honor in all the choices of our lives. Please bow your heads to pray. Father God, we thank you for your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that in his darkest moments, he did not fear the crowd around him, he did not fear Pilate or the Jewish leaders but he put his trust in you. And we thank you that in your mercy, you preserved him through the cross and by the power of your spirit, raised him to new and eternal life on that first Easter morning. We thank you for pouring out your spirit on all who live and believe in you and ask that you would give us the courage to always stand for you to not be afraid of the judgments of the world around us and not to be afraid of what other people think about us, but instead to always be obedient to and follow you. Father, forgive us when we fail to do so and use our church family to help us to follow you in the way that leads to eternal life.